Video recording has started. Record video stop button. Double tap to activate. Here was peace. She stumbled on. The snow had drifted deeply here and in some places was much beyond her depth. But she floundered on again and again, plunging down into what seemed bottomless depths and went struggling up again on to the place where they laid her sister that afternoon. The drifts were deeper here for the wind had been at work, sweeping down the long barrel road from the hilltop, hurling the eddying snow higher. At the side, there were places where it was even now above her head with only a narrow path that was weightable around it. And ever she struggled on, each step seemed more and more impossible. The tears had frozen on her white cheeks and her lips were numb with cold. The frozen cry of her heart stifled in her throat and there was none to hear. Oh, Louise, my sister, let me come with you. Then, suddenly, she stumbled forward and lost her footing in a deep, deep drift that seemed to envelop her, and there above her loomed the big stone arch that marked the ent entrance of the cemetery. She sank back wearily, and the great white drift received her and enfolded cold arms about her. The lights from the stone arches touched her gold hair till it looked like a coronet and the long sable-edged robe wrapped her round like a sumptuous winding sheet. Once she opened her eyes, looked up to the gateway, and tried to struggle up again, but found herself too weary and sank back once more, dreaming that her wish for death was coming true, for Herbert would never think to seek for her here. She was alone and safe at last. With God, was God anywhere about, and did he care? Then she closed her eyes, and the snow softly fell on her face and on her eyelids, and on the light and the moonlight glinted down and touched her with unearthly beauty. Okay, we're gonna just move on to chapter two, I think. Here we go. Chapter two. Howard Sterling, the young house doctor from the sanitarium at Enderby, had been detailed to accompany a patient home who was still in a critical condition, but whom, for certain reasons, it seemed best to put back among familiar surroundings for a time. They went in the ambulance. Two nurses had attended on the way and were to remain with the patient indefinitely. The young doctor was to stay overnight if it seemed necessary, but if all went well, he had promised to return that evening so that another intern who was taking his place in his absence might get away to attend his sister's wedding. The journey was a short one, having taken little over an hour. The patient had borne it well and did not seem much exhausted. The experiment of bringing him home had proved so far an, a successful one, and he seemed to be resting comfortably. There was no reason at all why the young doctor should stay any longer. The ambulance had returned immediately, but there was still time to make the six o'clock train back to Enderby and take over for Brownlee so that he could start early for the wedding. On the other hand, there was a girl, Rose Bradford, in whom he was somewhat interested. She lived only five miles from the house of the patient, and there was time, if he hurried, to make a call upon Rose and then return to see how the patient fared before catching the seven o'clock train from the crossroads junction. It was an express and would get him to Enderby a little after eight. He could telephone Brownlee to arrange for one of the other doctors to take over during the brief interval, only a half hour or so. That would still get Brownlee to the wedding in time. It was better, perhaps, that he should arrange to do this and so have time to take another look at the patient before he left anyway. And so his decision was made. There was no difficulty in securing a conveyance to take him over to the Bradford estate. The grateful family of the patient could not do enough for him. In a short time, Dr. Sterling was speeding in the luxurious car. Joined to meet Rose, Bra toward Rose Bradford. It happened that Rose was even more interested in me meeting the young doctor than he was in her, and she was quite anxious for her father to meet him. She knew her father was 
a man of influence, and could, if he to- chose, put her young doctor on his way to a name and fame and placement far beyond the mere drudgery of a common house jo- doctor in a private hospital. So as soon as she had received his telephone call, she had set about at once, planning how she might keep him at home until her father's return that evening to dinner and for the night. Then they would have opportunity to get acquainted. There was quite a house party of young people staying at Bradford Gables, and they put their heads together to make arrangements for a brilliant evening affair that would, without doubt, beguile the staunchest and sternest adherent to duty that the medical profession could show. So when young Sterling Barry arrived at the Gables, joined. he f- found the stage set for a prolonged stay with a delightful program prepared. He looked about on the luxurious house and down on the attractive rose girl who ra- awaited his answer with eyes that pleaded eloquently and felt greatly tempted. Rose Bradford was small and slender with wild rose cheeks and lips like a small red bud. Her hair was dark and curly and fitted close about her face. He looked down admiringly into her lovely, dark, melting eyes, and his expressive face took on that indulgent gentleness used in speaking to sweet, pretty children. How I wish I could, he said wistfully. It would be most charming. You certainly are an enchantress, and perhaps I should turn and flee at once. For you are making it more and more difficult for me. The eyes melted their sweetest into his glance, and the pleading began in a soft, gentle voice. She was thinking how engagingly the doctor's crisp hair waved away from his forehead. He was handsome as a Greek god. Why did he have to be poor and a doctor? Why hadn't he been born the son of a millionaire instead of the tiresome Channing Foswick that her mother wanted her to marry? There was a fresh, bright color in the doctor's cheeks that spoke of abounding health and clean living, but Rose didn't think much about such things. She was admiring the interesting, whimsical twinkle in his gray eyes, and she was determined to keep him at the house as long as possible, so she kept up her insistence. But I can't possibly stay, he told her. The man who is taking my place at the sanitarium is due at his sister's wedding tonight. I promise to be back and take over. Rose shrugged her dainty shoulders. After all, what is a sister's wedding? He wouldn't be missed, she said. It isn't as if it were something necessary like illness or death. Can't you make it up to him afterward? Get him a whole day off or something? Besides, wouldn't he think the patient had required you to stay? Isn't it really safer for you to stay a few days and see how the patient gets along at home? Surely you ought to stay, Mary at least County overnight. Joined. But the young Dr. Sterling, in spite of his Greek god features, had a strong, firm chin under the Phoenix. curve of his ple- pleasant mouth. No, he said, I couldn't do anything like that, not for anyone. I have made a promise, and I will not go back on it. Brownlee is depending on me. It wouldn't be right. The melting brown eyes flashed. The lips took on a look of scorn. He would never know, she said stormily. No, he said firmly. She argued and coaxed, but all to no purpose. The time was going where they had hoped to have filled with pleasant talk. so And so at last he left her, quite disappointed that she had been so unreasonable, so determined to have her own way. Of course, she had been brought up to have everything she desired, and he was a fool even to th- play around for an hour or two with such a girl. She was not for him. He still had his way to make. He could never hope to give her all she would want. But although he had started away in plenty of time for the plan he had made, the costly car in which he had been sent to Bradford Gables was not equipped for the snow that had fallen so rapidly in such short a time. And a slight breakdown delayed them further so that when they were back at the Martin Mansion, it was quite dark and he was not a little worried lest he was even now going to have trouble in his train. Also by this time, his mind had suffered a revulsion and it began to seem little sense of cruel to have come away, leaving the beautiful girl so unhappy. He began to question his own actions. Brownlee, had perfectly understood that it might not be possible for him to return in time. Perhaps it would have been all right to have stayed. 
Well, he would see how the patient was, let that settle it. And yet, did he have the face to return to Rose after he had been so decided in refusing to stay? He went up to his patient and found him sleeping quietly, his pulse steady, his whole condition very good. Well, there was nothing for it but to go back to the sanitarium and send Brownlee off to the wedding. The chauffeur, meanwhile, had put chains on the car, but the family of the patient was solicitous about him. They begged him to telephone the sanitarium and stay at least overnight. The storm was a real blizzard, they said. He might be snowed in on the train for hours. But when he firmly resisted their appeals, Johnny John. they served him with hot delicacies and ins insisted on loaning him a great fur overcoat, which they said would keep him warm on the train, in case they were snowed in, and at last he had started. It was not far to the junction, only a matter of four or five miles, and the man had orders to stay overnight at the junction if the roads were too bad to return home, so there was no need to worry about him. Sterling had telephoned Brownlee just before leaving the house, and the relief in the other's voice when he found Sterling was returning left no doubt in his mind concerning his duty. Also, Brownlee's report of one particular patient made him still more anxious to get back to his work. But as he sat in the dark in the car, continually Rose Bradford's pretty alluring face kept coming across his vision. The disappointed pout, the tearful eyes... Yet, what had he to do with her, child of luxury, who had stooped to coax one of the world's workers to while away a stormy evening? He set his lips in the darkness and began planning how he might conquer fate, make himself a force in the world, one who would have a right to court a girl like Rose. The car wallowed through the uneven road, plunged from side to side, and was aggravatingly slow. Sterling studied his watch by the light of his pocket flash and saw it was getting perilously close to the time when the train would pass the junction. The, <clears throat> the world stretched white and wide as he looked through the window. White darkness, terribly white. And even the lighted windows of the houses they passed made but small blurs Aries. of color. Hard. The Joined. progress of the car grew slower and slower. Then they came to an enormous drift that spread wide and high before them. Then the driver got down to reconnoiter. A great wall of snow seemed to have reared itself impassably across the way. Sterling opened the car door and leaned out, calling questions, making futile suggestions. And then the driver uttered a sharp cry, a call, it really was. And Sterling sprang out and went to his side. It was then he saw her. There, in the full glare of the headlights of the car, she lay, pillowed in the snow, her gold hair matted with ice where the velvet hood had fallen back. The velvet drapery of her cloak was fast disappearing under the hurricane of the sleet, and there, above her, arched the great stone gateway of the cemetery. It was a startling sight on a night like this, the beautiful girl with the white, white face in its setting of blue and gold and snow. He, bl he glanced about him to see if there was anything to explain the phenomenon of a lovely young woman thus attired asleep in a snowdrift in front of the cemetery in this awful storm. But only the driving sleet and the lonely distance of impenetrable whiteness had answered his question. If it was as if the heavens had come down in a majesty of snow and lifted the earth up in a deep embrace. Then his physician's instinct and training instantly began to work. He plunged over to where the girl was lying and tried to lift her, giving directions to the frightened chauffeur, who was reluctant to touch what seemed to him an apparition, but they finally succeeded in carrying her to the car and laying her on the cushions. Then the driver, wishing he were anywhere but on the road in a night like this, essayed to find the road. He had taken the precaution to bring a snow shovel along and working with all his might, managed to clear a way back into the main road. So climbed to his seat and started his car, his mind still heavy over the burden of beautiful death behind him. And meanwhile, Sterling knelt beside the silent girl, touching her cold, cold face that seemed so death-like. He lifted the stiff little hand, but no response came. He threw back the frozen velvet cloak from the softly garmented breast and stooped his skilled ear to listen if there was still life in her body. 
He could not be sure, but he worked swiftly with what remedies he had at hand. There was no time to lose. He jerked off the worn fur coat in which his hostess had enveloped him and wrapped it around the girl's still form. He chafed her cold hands. He took off the draggled slippers, stiff with ice, and held the little icy feet in his warm hands, drying them and finally wrapping Joined. them in a fur robe from the car. With his pocket flash, he looked keenly into her face again for any signs of life. Then, from his case, he forced a few drops of stimulant between those white lips. But it was hard to tell whether they got farther than the lips, for he must work almost in the dark. The face still looked marble white and peaceful in its unearthly beauty. And there was something so exquisitely pure and almost holy about her that he touched her with awe. In desperation, he laid his own face against the girl's face and felt the chill of her flesh. He laid his lips upon hers and tried to think he felt a warmth stealing into them. Then, suddenly, he was confronted with the problem of what to do with her. They had reached the foot of the long hill below the cemetery. The village could not be far away. He could see dim lights whirring through the storm. He knew it was almost train time, for he had looked at his watch just before they, he had stopped their car. They had stopped their car. Would it be possible for him to stop somewhere and leave his burden and still make his train? He called to the chauffeur. Is there a doctor near here you can call before the train comes? The chauffeur shook his head. Village is half a mile away. I don't know any doctor around here. Well, can you take her into the station and get someone to take charge of her at once? I must make the train. Station's closed, said the man tersely. Well, what can you do with her? Asked the doctor sharply. She ought to have help at once to save her life if it isn't too late already. Me? I can't do nothing, gasped the man in horror, stepping away from the sight of the closely wrapped figure. Perhaps you know her and can take her to her friends, he suggested looking anxiously toward the now oncoming train. They will be searching everywhere for her. I don't know nobody down this way, said the man stubbornly, with a frightened ring to his voice. I've just been to the house up yonder about two weeks. You'd better take her onto the train with you. I can't do nothing with her. Then the train was upon them, and then there was no more time to think. Sterling lifted his burden with the help of the chauffeur, which is who was all too anxious to get it away, and curious, startled officials received it and carried it awesomely to a compartment in the Pullman, which happened to be vacant. Sterling lingered on the step of the car a moment, shouting directions to the chauffeur, who readily promised anything to have him gone with the strange girl whom he was certain was dead. Ugh, certainly he would inform his people at once of the stranger who had been found and ask Mrs. Martin to give the information to the surrounding co countryside. Of course he would go to the police headquarters in the village so that the girl's friends could find her. He assured Sterling that he would do all in his power to locate her folks, and his relieved countenance smiled benignly at the young doctor through the storm as the train took up its laborious way through the snow. The man watched the train out of sight and then hurried to his car, resolved not to say a single word to anybody about the affair. In his opinion, that girl was dead, and maybe he would get mixed up with a murder case somehow if he let on that he knew anything about it. Moreover, he had decided on the way over to Bradford Gables that evening that people who would ask a chauffeur to go out in a storm like this for any guy just to see a girl or catch a train weren't good folks to work for, and now was as good a time as any to leave. He would take that car home, and then he would vanish in the morning. What that doctor ought to have done was to leave that girl lying there in the snow and let her own folks find her. She must have been dead long before they got there anyway, and it was none of their concern. What was the use of turning everything upside down and being uncomfortable for someone who was already dead? He believed in looking out for number one always and everywhere.
So he went to the village and took a little much-needed much stimulant and managed to get the car back to its owner's garage so late that he did not come in contact with any of the family. He said not a word about the strange experience he and the visiting doctor had encountered. He spent the rest of the night packing his effects for a hasty departure, and quite early in the morning, he announced to his master that he had heard through a cousin he had met in the town the night before that his mother was very sick, and he felt he should go to her at once. So he received his wages and departed before anyone had time to question him. And long before the doctor had ventured to disturb the family, whether the family whether they had to ask whether they had found out anything about the girl, he had disappeared from the region. So the family knew nothing about the happening in the storm. Like a frail, crushed lily, Janice lay in her white bed at the sanitarium and made a little response to the treatment given her. It was as if she had gone too far into the world of whiteness and shadows to return. Meanwhile, back in the house from which she had fled, the drink-crazed man had searched in vain to find her. In puzzled anger, he had at last pieced together a story. He told the servants and a few neighbors who came to inquire that his sister-in-law had gone on a visit to the far west with a relative, and it might be some time before she returned. Then he hastily closed his house, offered it for sale, and went his way into a far country. Some ten days later, there appeared in the local papers of the region, near the Martins' estate, a brief account of the young woman who had been found near the cemetery gateway on the night of the blizzard. But not one of all of the host of friends who loved Janice and her dead sister recognized her from the brief description given. A lovely girl attired in thin white and sumptuous velvet cloak trimmed with fur. The Janice they knew would never have tracked the drips, tramped the drifts on the road to the cemetery in a blizzard. It never occurred to anyone that the young woman who had been found and who was lying near death's door in a nearby sanitarium could be Janice Whitmore. She would write to them, of course, as soon as she rallied from the death of her beloved sister. This other girl was probably some poor dancer from a cabaret, a sinner, or perhaps sinned against, and in desperate situation trying to end her life. What a pity, they said, and thought no more about it. So the days went on, and only the young doctor who had found her and this slowly was slowly bringing her back to life again had any interest in her. Her brother-in-law had no thought of her, not even of wonder as to what had become of the young helpless young girl who had been left in his power and who had escaped him his only fear was that janice had gone to a distant cousin who was a famous lawyer and knew all about the financial affairs of the two sisters he did not wish to get under the keen eyes of that lawyer nor listen to his questioning about the estate for janice was scarcely of age as yet and this cousin had been an executor of the sisters inheritance he did not care to have that cousin know how he had tampered with the estate and how greatly it had diminished under his hand. The wondering servants in his household had shaken their heads in his household, mindful of the loud voice and the way the master had thundered orders to the girl, mindful of the unwelcome embraces at the foot of the stairs, the wild fight in the girl's eyes. What had he done to her? Had he she gone out alone in that storm, and what had happened to her? Furtively, they searched the house, even down to the cellar, every cranny where she might have hidden, but they were dismissed and far away before any news came out about the girl that was found. Right later, when Dr. Sterling communicated more at length with Mrs. Martin, she employed detectives and did her interested best to find out who this mysterious girl could have been, but nothing ever came of it. And the girl lay white and listless in her hospital bed, unconscious of the what went on be about her. Utterly forgetful of all the recent happenings, coming out of chill, cold, and going into burning fever, buried in the oblivion of delirium, opening her white lips only to moan in low helplessness, quiet only when the cool hand of the doctor was laid on her hot forehead. Once or twice she opened her eyes and looked up at him with a frightened glance, fearful questioning, and then slowly her eyelids drooped and closed over the troubled eyes as if satisfied. She drew a soft little sigh and seemed to rest more quietly. It strangely touched the young doctor as if somehow she were dependent 
depending on him. And as if in some occult way, she had understood she had understood that he had saved her from death in the storm. Yet if she had any memory of what had brought her to this pass in the midst of her delirium and fever, he could not tell. She was very ill, of course. N pneumonia had taken possession of her, and there seemed to be no strength in her to resist the disease. Sometimes he wondered if perhaps death would be a sweet release to her from things worse than death. Of course, he did not know anything about her, had no means of even guessing, save from the swift, sweet, sad droop of the lovely lips. Yet more and more, he longed to save her, to bring her back to life and see her smile once, to know that he had been able to lift the shadow from the pitiful, tired young face. As a doctor, dancing, underscore, all underscore, he should time not underscore. let him be interested in a patient in this way. Interest like that was apt to cloud his mind and blunt his perceptions. And this girl was nothing to him. Whenever, Yet whenever he said that to himself, he kept seeing her so white and still, lying in that snowbank, sinking into a quick death, and his heart reached out and longed to help her. When the disease itself was practically conquered, there was the great weakness to deal with, the utter listlessness and apathy. Sometimes, when her nurse was busy elsewhere, he would come and sit beside her for a few minutes and study the sweet, quiet face. Now and again, he would take the little inner hand in his and hold it gently, and once he fancied that the fingers nestled to his. But perhaps that was mere imagination. Once, as he sat thus, he bowed his head and murmured almost inaudibly, Oh, God, you know what this is. Grant me knowledge to help. And when he looked at her again, her eyes were open just for an instant. She seemed to be studying him with a question in her glance. And when he smiled at her, there came a faint semblance of a smile to her lips. But then her eyes closed and the smile was gone. Howard Sterling was not a praying man, and he couldn't understand why he had uttered that sudden, unpremeditated petition. But somehow he felt after that smile that God had heard and answered in a way. Afterwards, he told himself he was a fool to make so much of this instant of the girl, and he ought to get away from it and let somebody else take up her case. Perhaps it would be a good thing for him to take a few days off and make that promised visit to Rose, get his mind off the sanitarium and everything connected with it. Rose would be off him for life if he didn't do something about keeping his promise, but somehow he didn't go. He kept putting it off again and again for various little reasons until one night he told himself that he really didn't want to go until he saw a decided improvement in, in this girl. That would make Rose furious if she knew it, but it was true nevertheless. And of course, it was true that he ought not to be so obsessed with the case of an unknown, mysterious girl. But it would soon be spring. The snow was gone, and in places, the trees were beginning to take on a semblance of greenness. If the girl could get out into the open and breathe the springtime air, it would surely give her new life. Perhaps he might even venture to take her out riding someday when she was stronger and try to coax from her a little of her story. It did seem as if after all this time, they ought somehow to be finding her people. If she were strong enough, he might take her to the place where he had found her, and perhaps that would bring back memories. But no, that would not do, for the other utter sorrow and abandonment of her whole attitude showed that she must have sustained some great shock or she would not be in this condition. But the days went by, and little by little, Janice came slowly back to life again. Okay, that is the end of chapter two, everyone. I'm going to just check. Um, welcome. I There was probably about 10 people who joined. Welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for joining. I'm doing an audio reading of the Spice Box by Grace Livingston Hill uh, with my grandma. Um, so hopefully... Um, you guys are enjoying that. I'm also putting the videos up on YouTube so that um, if you came in the middle of the stream, um, you will be able to go back on my channel. Hopefully, you can go back on my channel and um, and um, see what happened before. 
or if you can't make it, if you've been following, um, and you can go back on my channel, maybe if you missed uh, a stream, because I don't know, I can't really schedule them, so I don't know when they're going to be scheduled. So anyways, I'm going to have a look and see what you guys are up to. See what comments I detected. didn't Detect see. Hey, in list. Ryan Johnston. Hey, Ryan Johnston. Hey, how Double are you tap doing? Activate. Double tap and hold to long How are you doing today? Unlabeled. Button. Invite. Unlabeled. Uh, we have about to go live together. We have about 18 people that I know of with us today, but that could be invite. I haven't Unlabeled. really been In keeping one of your friends too good of a track. So encourage your viewers to unlabeled. And hi. Mitch. Yeah, okay. Good Un stuff. Unlabeled. Invite. Yeah. Unlabeled. Invite. So yeah, don't unlabeled. think I'm ignoring you. Um hey. Detected. I just I'm doing audio Join. reading. Double tap and of hold to long press. the chapter. Use tap with three um, I'm doing audio reading, and so the the audio reading goes really fast. So I'm not really able to stop and uh, look at. Oh, hang on. Plus hosts. Okay, what second? Double tap to activate. Okay. Double tap and hold to Are you long okay? Press. No. What's the matter? I gotta go to the. Bathroom. Okay, we'll uh, we'll get All you right. squared away, Roy. I'm on. Okay, guys, you're gonna have to. Go in the room for a sec mm -hmm. and listen to the radio because grandma's got to go to the YouTube video too. Because yeah. I'm trying to do all this stuff at once. Zoom okay. Out. Zoom shutter button. Z zoom out. Zoom it shutter. Record video stop. There we go.